this special edition of Spotlight, the impact of COVID-19 on our nonprofit community, is brought to you in part by presenting sponsor, Busey Bank. Busey, your dreams, our promise. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm your host, Jane Wernat, and we're doing a special edition today uh, to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the not-profit sector right here in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by five of our colleagues here who are leaders in the not-for-profit community. Uh, Judy Caribou, she is the CEO of uh, 360U Services. I've got Dr. Scott Mitchell. He is the CEO and president of Samaricare Counseling. Mike Cavallo, who is the uh, president and CEO of Loaves and Fishes Community Services. Kim White, who is our executive director of the Career and Networking Center. And then Carol Simler, who is our CEO and president of DuPage Pads. And Carol, I, I'm going to start right off with you because we have been in a stay-at-home order since uh, March 21st here in Illinois. And obviously that's had a lot of people home and in their houses. But for your population, the clients that you serve, uh, home is a whole different conversation. And so I'm going to pitch the question to you in terms of how is DuPage Pads been serving those in the homeless population? Um, certainly has impacted our services and the way we do business. Um, it, it, it's about a month ago now, we adapted to a new service model. And we had to do it quickly and efficiently and look at the well-being of our clients. Um, we really worked hard and are continuing to work hard to ensure social distancing and the health of the people that we serve. So we made a difficult decision to temporarily suspend our congregational model for interim overnight housing. And within 24 hours, we moved to the hotel model. Hmm. Right now, um, we have 93 rooms in three different hotels, and we are serving 120 people in those hotel rooms. Hotel rooms. It was difficult when, when we had to say, we cannot do the congregational model any longer. And as congregations were closing and also volunteers, the, well, the well-being of our volunteers. So to do that, um, we adapted our service model. We had served 213 people as of March 1st. We contacted all those people. And I called the board chair and said, I need $42,000 from general operating to begin this hotel model. And we did it. So we started out with 20 rooms and now we're up to 93. And we'll probably be going up to about 100 by next Monday. Um, what we did, we looked at who were the most vulnerable. And those were our seniors with pre-existing conditions, families, and then individuals. What we did too, we established our client service center in Wheaton as a drop-off center and also um, we, where we received donations. And that's been an incredible movement because now we're a distribution center as well. So we, every 48 hours, we're contacting people in hotels. Every day we're at those hotels four, five times a day with our staff. We also um, uh, employed our street outreach team as well. So we worked with the mayors and managers, the police, the fire departments, for anyone that is unsheltered on our streets. And so we go and engage those people and really work with them to move them to uh, a better place, a healthier place. We also have become a, a point of uh, entry for anyone leaving the hospitals that are homeless that are non-COVID related um, injuries or illnesses. We continued our respite program as well for people who need rest and then they become a client of ours and then enter our hotel system as well. So we are so grateful to the DuPage community and the fact that we were able to make this work by the donations, by the partnerships that we have, especially with the DuPage County Health Department. Um, they, I am in contact with them every day. We're checking temperatures as people come to work. Most of our folks are working remotely. 
We're also checking the temperatures of the people that we're with. And I can say, as of this moment, we have not experienced the COVID disease. So we're very happy about that. Certainly we're, we're concerned about the isolation like everyone else is. And so the mental health of the people that we serve is very important. So we're engaging the mental health services, NAMI of DuPage, and also counseling services as well. So <laughs> we've adapted and we've been successful doing that. Yeah, Carol, I know that's been a huge lift for you. And, and Mike, you, you're experiencing a lot of similar situations at Loaves and Fishes. So please tell us a little more. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, first and foremost, we've seen a, a huge increase in demand uh, for our services with the, uh, the, the sudden and dramatic loss in jobs all across the U.S. and here as well. Uh, a lot of people who were struggling, you know, are, are struggling more and people who were maybe not struggling, who were maybe keeping their heads above water, uh, are now struggling and are now uh, below the line as far as being able to, uh, to keep afloat, if you will. And so we've seen a lot of new clients as well. Uh, if you look across the U.S., there's uh, various forecasts out there, but the expectation is that food insecurity in the U.S. will rise by about 45 percent here. Uh, you know, during this time. That's a giant increase. Uh, last Thursday, as an example, uh, we served about triple the number of people that we served. On a typical Thursday during the day, we might serve 150 families. Uh, last Thursday, we served 435 families. That's a lot of people. Uh, and we provided a lot of food to people. Uh, we provided over 40,000 pounds, that's 20 tons of food on that one day alone. Uh, and so, you know, the impact on our clients has been absolutely dramatic and, and staggering. Uh, we've also had a change dramatically the way we operate. You know, our, the question that we answered is we're, we expect to see a huge increase in demand. How can we operate in a way that safety remains first and foremost? Uh, we, we need to protect the safety of our clients, or our volunteers, employees. So we've had to completely change our uh, delivery model uh, for food and, and doing curbside service rather than uh, shopping through our market with client choice. So uh, the only way that we're able to serve the people in need is by dramatically changing our model. And so we've adapted. Uh, and I'll say uh, kudos to our operations team for uh, making some very <clears throat> sudden and dramatic changes uh, for us to be able to, to stay open and, and to serve a lot more people. Yeah, and, and I, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. And I think it, it's going to lead kind of into Kim, and I'm going to come to you next, because obviously, and I know I've heard Carol talk about this over the years, that, you know, so much of, of the situation that increases the amount of people being serviced at uh, DuPage Pads and the number of people being served at Loaves and Fishes really starts with that fundamental piece of employment, right? And obviously, mm -hmm. during this pandemic, we're seeing epic proportions of people being furloughed, laid off, you know, without a job. So, uh, Kim, talk about how that's impacting your agency at the Career Networking Center. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jane. I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues. Um, you know, for the Career Networking Center, you know, this is our focus and our mission. We are providing job search uh, resources to assist job seekers to fulfilling employment. So that is our focus and our mission. Um, needless to say, we've been greatly impacted from the millions of people who have been laid off and have filed for unemployment, um, we are seeing it firsthand. And uh, quite frankly, it's it's sobering. Um, but, you know, what we've been doing in this time, you know, with unemployment, while it's temporary for, for, for some, um, it's going to be more of a long-term thing uh, for, for others. And so, you know, we are continuing to work tirelessly to bring all of our resources online. Um, I mean, that was really the initial um, ramification ramification of COVID-19 was um, we had to work feverishly behind the scenes to, to get all of our resources online. And so we were able to do that. So all of our networking groups, our, our um, accountability groups, all of our one-on-one -on -one coaching with our clients, those did not miss a beat. It took us three days from the time we got that stay at home order on March 13th to Monday morning, 
March 17th, we had all of our services online and we have seen hundreds of people signing on to our workshops and networking and getting the things that they need as they are in this job search. Um, the other thing that we're doing, and again, as I mentioned with my colleagues here, you know, we are making sure that our, our folks know about the other services in our community so that they are also, you know, able to connect in that way. I think it's, um, it, it, it's such a, we talk a lot in the not-for-profit space about collaboration and mm -hmm. sort of the traps, gaps, and overlaps and all of that. And I think um, one of the things we're seeing certainly is that connection between the agencies. And, you know, Judy, I'm going to come to you because obviously you serve a, a, a very fragile, I mean, for, for us, we're all adults going through this, right? And, and it's hard to comprehend. Uh, but you're dealing with a lot of young people, uh, a lot of marginalized people. Talk a little bit about how you've seen this impact at 360 Youth Services. First of all, Jane, thanks for pulling this group together and, and doing this special edition of the Spotlight. I think this is a really important topic and it's wonderful, as Kim said, to be here with uh, our colleagues uh, talking about this. Um, so 360 Youth Services, we provide uh, counseling, uh, housing and prevention, drug and alcohol prevention for those who are uh, around 13 to 24 years old. So like you said, a very at risk and uh, very uh, kind of marginalized and high risk um, risk population. Um, you know, it's it's really unfortunately thrown our young people into adulthood very quickly. Uh, like many of the other nonprofits that have talked uh, before me, um, we were able to pivot pretty quickly um, and uh, offer a lot of our ser services virtually. So we offer our counseling appointments uh, all virtually, um, which is being wonderfully embraced, believe it or not, um, with the young with young people. Um, we um, are doing a lot of work with our prevention group um, and a lot of outreach into the schools through e-learning and are able to continue that drug prevention curri curriculum through the um, virtual classroom. Um, but our housing, like uh, DuPage pads, our housing has to be done uh, again face to face. So that's the essential workers piece um, that we fit. And so uh, we still have our group home. Uh, that uh, houses those who are 13 to 17 years old. We're both caretakers as well as teachers, just like many families. Um, and we've got our transitional housing program where we've got uh, young people 18 to 24 who have lost their jobs. Uh, they were a lot of the hourly workers who were making some headways and, and progress towards independence. So they have really felt this pandemic um, pretty intensely. Uh, they've lost their job. Uh, there's this kind of sense of setback and I, you know, I thought I was doing really great. I was doing all of the right things and now here's this big setback. So for some, the prospect of uh, going on to college is, is at risk right now is threatened because the money they were hoping to save with the jobs they were in uh, is no longer an option. So uh, the, the, the anxiety that our young people are feeling is uh, around the short term as well as long term. And I also think there's this great sense of loss. There's a lot of milestones that these, um, um, our young people are not able to participate in. And um, I think some of the issues that staff is wrestling with right now is what is this gonna, what is the long-term consequence gonna be for our young people? This is definitely gonna be one of those issues that is, the, is on those ACES studies years from now as our young people get older and is gonna to contribute to some of the physical health issues that we're gonna see as they um, uh, you know, come into their adulthood. Yeah, and I think that as we as we kind of talk about that, and I'm, I'm glad we're going to Scott next because obviously, Scott, this is an area that Samaricare uh, has been heavily involved in, and, and it is this mental health piece. We've talked a lot over the years, I know, about the stigma of mental health uh, and, and how do we get through that, but we're certainly in a time where everybody's mental health is, is, is challenged. So say how you're uh, seeing things turn out at Samaricare and some of the things that you've heard from your colleagues as far as how that's playing through. Well, uh, thanks again, Jay and too. It's, it is good to be here with uh, my colleagues. It just it mirrors the strong uh, uh, support network we have in collaboration in this community. Uh, Samaricare, what we do primarily is outpatient mental health counseling, uh, age two all the way up to 92, so across the lifespan. 
Uh, maybe what I'll say first is just generally the uniqueness of how this uh, pandemic is impacting us all, because it's very different than many other tragedies that we've had in this com country. And the, the biggest difference is that uh, when we need each other the most, we're actually called to distance from each other. Uh, when we want to get out and, and uh, kind of relax, given the stress, we have to pull back in. We can't do the things we normally do. And both of those things cause, uh, you know, tremendous stress for all of us. Typically, we're encouraged to, you know, visit our local businesses and connect with one another, but we're not, we can't do that within this uh, pandemic. So it does spike anxiety and stress for all of us, and that's normal. Uh, it depends on how we deal with it as to whether it becomes uh, more abnormal. Uh, the uncertainty of health, of job loss, of income, all of those things is what's driving uh, the anxiety we all deal with. Um, at Samaricare, uh, we work with a variety of people with a variety of uh, presenting problems, but many have depression and anxiety. And so what I just said, what we're all experiencing, those who have anxiety and depression is just exacerbated uh, even more. Uh, you know, I, I can think of a, a client of mine actually that I just saw this morning uh, who has severe asthma and has her whole life. Most of us wouldn't think about it, but for her, uh, she also deals with uh, panic and anxiety. Her panic and anxiety is off scale because she knows what it's like not to breathe. And the fear of even encountering uh, this virus is just petrifying and, and it's kind of frozen her in that way. So at Samaricare, uh, we, we are um, an essential service uh, as defined by the governor because we're mental health and substance abuse. And so we can remain open and we've chosen to do that actually. Uh, as a way to continue to provide continuity and care for our clients. But we've done it in a safe way for both clients uh, and our staff. And so uh, we fortunately had been experimenting with telehealth uh, before this hit. We had four of our therapists trialing it. And once this hit within a week's time, so within a week's time, I had 30 therapists up and running on telehealth. That was, I mean, it was incredibly stressful, but we were happy to be able to provide that uh, for all of our clients. So now 95% of our therapists are uh, actually uh, doing telehealth services. And I would say, as, as Judy uh, said a little bit ago, it's working well. Uh, people who thought it would never work, it's working very well at this point. And we're able to provide uh, continued services in that way. And so, but that was a hit for us. I mean, it was something we didn't plan for budget wise, but we, uh, you know, were able to pull on resources that we have from donors to help us through that. So. I think, um, you know, and you talked a little bit about, uh, I think all of you in terms of this need to pivot fast. Uh, and I think, you know, kudos to everybody in each organization for being able to do that. I know uh, here at NCTV, we had to immediately go remote uh, and, and get a staff of 20 up and running and being able to continue to do the news in, in a way that was completely different than the way we normally collaborate and do stuff. So I, I, I know that's no small task. And I think, Scott, you kind of spoke to it, but all of you have spoken to to the importance of your staff. I mean, we talk about uh, the, the frontline workers with our hospitals and our doctors who are doing incredible uh, work, but you also have a lot of staff that is truly also on those front lines working with your clients and trying to help them through, but needing to keep them safe. So, you know, perhaps, and, and, and Mike, I'm gonna start with you. Talk a little bit specifically about some of the things you're having to do, not only with your staff, but for all of you, you're so dependent on those important volunteers. And, uh, you know, that, that trying to marry uh, the health of your clients and the health of your staff and your volunteers. So Mike, give us a little bit of an idea of what that looks like from inside the pantry perspective. Sure. No, absolutely. So, you know, obviously a big part of what we do is uh, distribute food to clients. We also have our CARES programs. With our CARES programs, we're able to uh, evolve that very quickly or adapt that very quickly to do things electronically with clients. Food is physical. 
right? So you, you can virtually provide somebody with food. It's, it's physical. And I talked about earlier how, you know, last Thursday we provided over 20 tons of food. So the big challenge for us was how do we do that, you know, on a, on a daily basis when we have distribution and keep everybody safe because you need people to physically move that food. And so we've taken a lot of precautions uh, with what we do in the building, with everybody, of course, in masks and gloves, and uh, the way we do intake with our clients that are coming in for food, we make sure it's really a drive up. Uh, don't roll down your, your windows of your car and pop the trunk open and we'll put the food in your trunk. So it's the curbside service where we're keeping that social distance and keeping to a minimum uh, any type of interaction and of course keeping so, you know, what we do, we've had to do with a lot, lot less people where on a normal distribution, we might have 75 or 100 people that are either employees or volunteers. That's not even including clients in the building. You know, we've kept it to about a dozen volunteers and employees at one time just to keep that distance uh, that's so critically important. So, uh, you know, for us, again, it was always safety first, uh, but the challenge that we had uh, is, is the physical movement of the product and making sure we do that in a safe way for, for everybody involved, clients, volunteers, and, uh, and our staff. Uh, we've also, I would say, uh, made sure that anybody that was in the CDC uh, high risk category, uh, we asked all those people to stay home. So uh, that's volunteers, staff. Uh, we just said, if you're in that high risk category with either age or uh, pre-existing medical conditions, you know, we want you to stay home for your own safety. And so that dramatically impacted um, who was available as well, too. Yeah, so, I mean, you've got a lot of people, and, and Carol, I'm going to come to you next, but you've got a lot of people who are doing a very heavy lift. Um, you know, I mean, the old adage, many hands make light work. You know, in these times, I'm sure for all of you, you're seeing, you know, you can't have as many hands in, the, in making light work. So it is very heavy lift for a few. Carol, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the specific precautions and things that you've been doing with your uh, population. And you talked about some, some of them who are very compromised. Sure. Um, you know, it's different to run a hotel model. Um, versus a congregational space. Um, but we learned along the way, too. Uh, I think what, what we're finding is that ending homelessness is more imminent than ever. Um, what is it going to be in the future? Who are we going to be in the future is the big question. So while we um, ensure the safety, the social distancing, masks, gloves, um, we still have people, and we know that people seeing people is much healthier than what we can offer over the phone. So um, actually, we, um, we're waiting for the uh, order from the governor. Um, and if it is going to be extended, we'll, we will be also renting, motel, uh, I keep saying motel, hotel rooms um, where our staff will be there during the day as well. Um, we also volunteers now are a different um, medium for us. So we, we depended heavily on volunteers for our congregational model. Now, when we are in hotels, it'll look different in the future in terms of our volunteer help and also the well-being of our volunteers, our staff and, and, uh, and the clients that we serve. So um, this is gonna be a different world now. Um, a world that's new and exciting and filled with more possibilities. So uh, the future holds what um, what our services are going to be and how they're going to be offered. And, and kind of let me take that. I'm going to throw this to Judy because I think, you know, uh, you talked a little bit about we're learning and we'll come back to that a bit more. But, but talk, Judy, if you would, about what you're seeing and what you're learning about the people that you serve as an organization through this process. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the, the, we knew this, but I think in, in this case, it was even more accentuated about how adaptable and resilient young people are. Um, embracing technology um, to be able to have counseling appointments mm -hmm. was something that was just very easy for our young people to do. Um, so I think there's this, you know, real sense of adaptability. Um, 
And there's this sense of really watching out for each other. It's been really interesting to see our young people who are in transitional housing, which means they each have um, a roommate and they're in apartments and how they're coming together to be supportive of each other um, has been really wonderful to watch. So it's been really wonderful to see young people um, not only be able to be adaptable and kind of go with what uh, life is throwing them um, and really show some great resiliency skills. It's also been really wonderful to see how young people, and it provides, I think, hope for all of us, how young people have been really embracing and, and working together to be able to address this pandemic. Um, I do think that some of our young people, particularly in our group home, um, to their chagrin, have become experts in cleaning. Um, as we've up, uh, stepped up our cleaning protocols, our, um, our young people are experts at cleaning, whether they like wanted to do that or not. I, I think that's great. I mean, we're, and we'll, we'll talk at the end a little bit about maybe what are some of those silver linings. But, you know, Kim, I, I, I want to come to you next because obviously uh, we're looking, you know, we went from one of the most robust uh, employment times to what is going to be catastrophic uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the level of unemployment. And so uh, we're, I'm sure, looking at a much different clientele than perhaps you have served in the past. So talk a little bit about what you're learning about some of the people that are using your, your services maybe for the very first time our clients are um, like everyone else right they're anxious they're scared but at the end of the day they're also resilient so you know at the current networking center we realize what every observer predicted we are experiencing this uh, enormous economic downturn with um, white wide scale layoffs um, but our services are vital and very important. And so we know that hundreds and hundreds of families are, are going to be using our services and we are going to continue to be, um, you know, that go-to resource center um, that, that they need. When I think back to 2008 and nine with the financial crisis, um, there was a, a huge increase in demand for our services back then. And we, we what we learned from that is that we needed to um, be adaptable, as Judy mentioned, you know, her, with her clients. But as a team, we also needed to be adaptable and be ready to serve our clients. So, you know, when I think back to how those first, you know, that first weekend when we learned of the stay-at-home order, um, there were sleepless nights. I don't think I slept at all, actually, <laughs> for those first three, you know, few, uh, few, few nights just to, to make sure we had everything in place for our clients because I knew we would be getting emails um, from folks who just needed our services. And so, again, we are at the ready. Our volunteers are ready. Um, and we are, we're here to serve. I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, the thing that just thrills me, and I'm so glad that we are all together, um, is, is just the incredible uh, sense of commitment to the clients that you serve. And I think, Scott, um, before we go to break, talk a little bit for us. You know, we're all serving in very different ways. Um, but I think the way that you serve cuts across all of those specific, unique uh, operational things that we're doing. What are you seeing out there and, and what guidance would you have for us? Well, I think I would mirror the word resilience and adaptability. A lot of our clients, uh, it's been good to see them adapt and, become, and tap into their resilience. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, particularly with some of our older adult population who might have been a little apprehensive about engaging telebehavioral health, but have done really well with it. And so, uh, and even working with parents with young children, uh, we've been able to do some play therapy, believe it or not, some of our child psychologists with young children who are in their own room, you know, doing play therapy, working <coughs> with different emotional issues that they have. People are learning to slow down, actually, too, and I think are finding value in that. I'll share a story. Uh, one of our uh, child psychologists is working with a, a young child and her mom, and the mom you know, is home with a, a baby and a six-year-old. And so they, uh, she took them out for a walk, and during uh, the walk, the, the, the six-year-old was on his bike, right? And the tire blew and they were out a ways from the house. Mom is stressed anyway, and now we got a bike that's not working. So she had to manage the bike, and the six-year-old is pushing the carriage back with the baby in it, right? And at one point, the six-year-old looks up at the mom and says, isn't this great? 
you know, we get to spend more time together. <laughs> you know, to which the mom, I mean, the mom actually called the therapist up later and shared that because it was a different perspective. You know, sometimes young children in this context are actually, uh, it's a good experience when we as adults are not experiencing that way. And I would just say that uh, to add on to that story is that each of us uh, deal with stress differently. And all of our family members are dealing with stress, but to be conscious of the fact that we all deal with it in different ways. Some have a harder time with it, some an easier time and to have empathy related to that. Um, the, the last thing I would say is that our staff, I mean, we at Samaricare operate as a team uh, and, and it's really important to us to be supportive of each other. And it's been hard, I mean, not being in the building together. So we've taken to doing a lot of Zoom, uh, small meeting groups, uh, to support one another uh, throughout this uh, crisis. And, um, you know, for example, you know, I was sitting with, again, one of my own clients um, just earlier this week, and um, she actually, her husband died uh, at Edward Hospital uh, of the virus. And uh, the staff there were wonderful because she could not be with her husband. But the um, what was hard for me in talking with her is not being present with her physically. I mean, we could talk like this, and we'll continue to do that, and probably we will, you know, following the CDC guidelines and all that, have her in. But it's those folks, too, that when, as a therapist, when we're dealing with that, that really is impactful for us, too. Uh, and being supportive of one another has been a, an important thing for our therapists to be engaging in as well. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, and, and, and we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about that support and, and how we're getting that support within the community. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Spotlight. For more than 150 years, you've believed in Busey. Today, more than ever, we believe in you. To our healthcare workers, first responders, and local businesses, you're central to the communities we're proud to call home. Busey's grateful to partner with you and your families through life's ups and downs, today and for generations to come. Because as neighbors helping neighbors, we're in this together. Busey, grateful to serve the communities we call home. While staying at home, stay informed and connected with Naperville Community Television. Get our free news updates emailed to you once a day, Monday through Friday. These emails keep you up to date with the latest information on the COVID-19 pandemic, how it's directly impacting our city, and how we're weathering the situation together, even while apart. Visit nctv17.com slash subscribe to sign up now. So welcome back to Spotlight. Uh, I'm joined here by Mike and Scott and Judy and Kim and Carol, and we're talking about how COVID-19 has impacted the nonprofit community. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, community support. That's an important part. Uh, as a sector, we're out there supporting clients, but we need the community to support the nonprofit sector. And obviously, this has caused a lot of changes in, in the revenue streams, how we fundraise and that kind of stuff. So Mike, I'm gonna start with you. Talk a little bit about about how this has really changed uh, in light of the pressure that we're seeing for businesses and individuals and uh, even the government as it relates to grants. Sure, absolutely. So I'd say a couple of things. First of all, we've been, I've just been simply amazed at how the community has stepped up in so many different ways in so many different areas, whether it's with people volunteering or supporting uh, things financially or even just creative ideas. It's just been an amazing outpouring of, of support uh, from the community. From a specific fundraising point of view, um, one of the keys is, is, is to communicate, communicate, communicate. So we need to make sure, because we can't be physically in front of people in the community, uh, to use technology and to make sure that we are communicating that, that there's been this dramatic increase in need. And as I said, the community has responded in a, just an absolutely significant 
in an amazing way. So on the use of technology, uh, we have our virtual food drive, which we launched last fall. And through the virtual food drive, uh, people can actually buy food online. We will fulfill their order and then provide it to clients. So compared to the traditional food drive where someone goes to a store, brings it home, uh, aggregates it with others maybe in their group and then brings it to our facility, to the virtual food drive, you can do this instantaneously uh, without leaving your, your home. And so that's, you know, we thought it was a good idea in the fall and it turned out to be a great idea uh, because that's been doing very well. It's, it's sort of a perfect fit for this, this time period. Um, you know, we've done a number of different things on, uh, on the technology side uh, as far as um, some creative plans where we've uh, jointly with some restaurants uh, done some things that have su supported both our local restaurants uh, as well as Lowe's and Fishes. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, thought and creativity uh, that goes into fundraising and really adapting uh, to how we can connect, communicate, uh, get the message out. You know, because one of the keys with what we do on the food side is the need is right here, right now. Uh, you know, somebody needs food, providing it a month from now really doesn't do much good if they need it right now. And so I think by us communicating that and people really seeming to understand that, uh, we've had some really positive uh, support from the community uh, overall. Kim, uh, talk a little bit about the Career Networking Center. Yeah, so, you know, like my colleagues and other nonprofits, the um, financial pressures are huge, you know, for, you know, our, our clients, uh, businesses, and, and of course us as nonprofits. Um, and I'm also mindful that um, we as nonprofits look to a lot of the same donors in our community, right, that, that are supporting us. So. Um, I keep that at the forefront as I think about what our ask is going to look like. Um, I think Mike mentioned the um, huge uh, support in our community from, uh, you know, the, the dine-in Naperville where we're supporting restaurants to the, the kindness um, hashtag where we're sharing, you know, positive thoughts of, around everything that's going on. Um, for the Career Networking Center, I mean, our major fundraiser, Dancing with the Celebrities, uh, we're not really sure how that's going to move forward this year. So for us, that's a that's a huge um, part of our budget, um, and we're trying to figure out how we're going how, how we're going to do that. Um, one of the things that we did do with the support of um, uh, some local folks in our communities, we have this um, sharing joy sign that's going around. Um, it's moving from one house to the next house to the next house every couple of days. And we, we look at it as we're spreading joy one house at a time. So that's been really good. We also had a group of folks who were running a, a half marathon. Um, and one day I just saw in our, in our PayPal account, we saw all these dollars coming in, $13 and 10 cents. So who knows what that what that is? Yeah, half marathon. Yeah, <laughs> half marathon, and it just started populating. Like, where? What is this? Where is this coming from? And then I, I get a note from a, a Facebook friend that said, "Hey, there's a group. We were running a half marathon, and everyone decided to make a thirteen dollar and ten donation to your center." So um, I can't tell you how many of those we got in. It was quite a few, but again. You know, the, the community has been great. I cannot say that enough. They have just really been great. I think one of the things, and I, uh, you know, just a shout out to our chamber because I think they launched the initiative with the, you know, spend money with the local mm -hmm. restaurants that then goes to our first responders. And I think yeah. this is where we look and go, this is great because this is yeah. collaboration. I mean, those restaurants, we call on them all the time as not-for-profits to support the work that we're doing. So I think being able to give them that opportunity to continue their business while we're paying it forward, if you will, I think is tremendous. Um, Judy, I know that you have been uh, needing, because all of us in, in the not-for-profit world have a lot of events that we use to uh, make money. And I know we've, at NCTV, we've moved our major fundraiser from May uh, out into October. And, and we're going to see that across the sector, I'm sure. It's going to be a giant moving where we can, some cancellations, but giant moving of the calendar. Uh, but, but you're also looking at some other ways that you can do some of that. Uh, so say a little bit about what you're doing at 360. 
Yeah, so um, we're participating, like many organizations, in the Give Out, um, Giving Tuesday that's this month, but we're also participating in Give Out Day uh, in June, uh, which is really more focused on the LGBTQ community because about 50% of those who are young adults in our care, uh, in our housing program, identify in the LGBTQ community. Um, I also think it's about getting creative, right? And I think there's been some great examples of being creative with fundraising and trying fundraising in a new world, a virtual world. And so we wanna be able to embrace the uh, LGBTQ community and identity and are looking at things like drag, a virtual drag queen bingo uh, event. So trying to be able to bring humor in this, um, in this time because we know the power of humor can really heal. Uh, and so looking to be able to, be, to provide some humorous times during this pandemic as well. Um, I do think that, that nonprofits tend to be a lagging economic indicator. Um, like you talked about earlier, Jane, that it's this trickle down and that right now I think um, the community has been absolutely amazing and you've heard it from my colleagues, absolutely amazing insofar as supporting needs. And we also know that just like the economy is gonna take time to recover, that is gonna have an impact on all of our clients. And there's gonna be this kind of slow recovery um, and slowly getting back to a new normal, particularly from an economic standpoint for all of our clients. And so I think the long-term is something that we all need to be looking at as well. And I'm sure we all are looking at what does fundraising for us look like in the long-term? For us, um, the government, the state, government has been really wonderful about making sure that the contracts are our contracts are paid on time and in full even if we're not able to meet deliveries because we're working remotely um, so there's this real support by the state government to make sure that agencies are still at, uh, have the capacity to be able to deliver services and when we look to um, the future with uh, income tax and uh, the filing for the state being delayed, that does mean that the state will uh, um, you know, be lacking funds in the not too distant future. And so what does that mean for all of us in the future and so far as delayed payments at some point down the line? So mm -hmm. once we get through this initial part of this pandemic, right, then in the short term, it's, we're not out of the woods as a nonprofit sector. And what do we need to be looking for as that next wave that we need to get ready for? And so um, I know that this community will continue to be extremely supportive. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that we need to continue to think about how do we make sure all of our agencies have the capacity to serve the need in the short term and the long term. Yeah, and I think, you know, Carol, I think uh, you were one of the last uh major not-for-profits that was able to get your large annual fundraising event off before uh, we sort of everything closed down. But you've obviously pivoted as well because uh, the model that you're working with, your hotel model, is a different model. It's more expensive than the one that you had previously. So say a little bit about how PADS is sort of pivoting as well in this uh, new era of fundraising. Sure. I think it's important to remember what we've learned and what we continue to learn through this whole pandemic. And that is that homelessness is a public health issue. And that also our clients are doing better because they're inside. And so the importance of having a home. Interesting fact, we've not had any 911 calls the whole time we've been open in our new model. And that's unusual for, for what we've had before. Um, and so we're saving the healthcare system thousands of dollars by just by that fact. The other is the tremendous support of the community. Chairman Cronin, um, our leader, was on the phone with me uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, the day that we turned this model around, offering his support, as well as other the county officials and elected officials as well. I think it's important that we continue to tell our story and that, that we really inform the community of what's working and what we're learning. Um, yes, we were fortunate enough to have our um, Taste of Hope event about a week and a half before this really became so public and so spreading. But we know the difference now. And we also know the power of we. And, and we've seen that with our community. So for us, um, Right away, we opened up an emergency relief fund. Our goal is $250,000. We're almost to 200,000 right now. But our expenses 
are an additional $200,000 a month. So um, it's an expensive venture, yes it is, but it's saving lives. And so that is our cry to the, to the public. A, we need to end homelessness in this county, in this nation. And B, we need to be saving lives. And the third thing is that we need to think about the power of we in this community and what we can do to make a difference. So yes, in the future, it's gonna be different. Yes, we're using social media, but I think it's about talking about our relationships, our relationships and our relationships, and in that, telling our story. And so then the power of we, our, and us becomes so evident in this community in the near future. Yeah, I think that's very true. We, not me, right? Um, and, and Scott, I, I want to toss that to you because, I mean, so much of your work is about relationships. Uh, and and I think, uh, you know, I'm curious as to whether you are seeing people talking more. I know in your business, and we've talked about this, uh, you know, the stigma, the silence around mental health. Uh, how do you feel in this time? Has, has this elevated that conversation? Is that causing people to have more discussion about it? Because maybe people who have never experienced any of those stressors are experiencing it perhaps more like some of the people who are seeking help from you and agencies like yours. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm in uh, all the national news channels you're hearing uh, a lot being talked about, not only about the physical impact of uh, the COVID uh, 19 virus, but also the psychological. It took a while actually though to start seeing that, but now I'm starting to see that get addressed more and it's normalizing it too. I mean, the idea that it's okay to feel anxious, it's okay to struggle, it's okay to reach out to get hope, uh, help. I think I've seen some of that as well. Uh, our, um, our silent Samaritan breakfast um, is our major fundraiser that got canceled on the uh, April 16th, and it's very relational. Uh, we always have client tell a story uh, of their struggle with mental health and how they've moved beyond that. And so uh, we ended up uh, with the help actually of NCTV and, the, and our volunteer uh, group that puts on that breakfast actually crafting several videos that we decided, you know, we can't have the breakfast, let's push that out still. Uh, videos of how to cope with it as an adult, uh, parents and seniors. Um, and so that's one of the ways we decided, you know, we're going to still be relational and push out the message of the silent Samaritan as well. Um, I, I do think, you know, I was around doing this in 2008, uh, as Judy uh, talked about earlier, and I've had a lot of memories uh, to then. We saw our fee subsidy program double. Uh, back then, it went from 250,000 a year to 500, and it's continued to go up. And I fully suspect that uh, we're going to see an aftermath of stress and anxiety after this, not only um, with uh, healthcare workers, but people that are unemployed, underemployed, um, you know, and, and stressed or grief relative to uh, family members who have died. Uh, but I, I like the idea that we'll get through this. I think the the idea of we is is really important. And then for me, as a, a person of faith uh, in our organization, I would say that that connection uh, to our faith and spiritual perspective, whatever that may be for someone, is also we've seen that become a huge support uh, for people dealing with uh, this crisis as well. I think that um, one of the things that, you know, obviously uh, everybody is going through this in different ways uh, and, and problems always, uh, they're problems, but they do present opportunities for growth and new solutions, new perspectives, uh, new learnings, uh, more of a sense of community. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about, uh, you know, how you, to Judy's point of, w at, at some point here, we will move beyond this. Um, probably not nearly as quickly as we'd all like, but but as we go through that, what are some of the positive lessons that you have learned uh, in this sector uh, or for your specific agency that you will carry forward with you? I mean, I know, you know, Mike talked a little bit about piloting a program that, you know, now 
click, we got to turn that right on. You know, the pilot was great, and now we're moving to it. Uh, there are going to be other examples of that, of things that, uh, you know, we have sort of walked slowly toward and now need to be running very quickly toward. Um, I'm going to start with you, Judy. What are some of the things that you feel you have learned, and, and, and what do you see kind of on the other side? Yeah. Well, my hope is that as an industry, as a non profit industry in this county that we actually take time and do a debrief collectively about what are some of the lessons we learned, uh, how did we respond collectively as an industry to this pandemic, what were the strengths around that, and what are things that we can improve? Because unfortunately, you know, a lot of the, you know, whether it's the World Health Organization or the CDC, there's um, a lot of indications that this is the first of at least two waves of this. And so how can we prepare for this next wave coming in, in the late fall and, and winter and take this time to actually be able to uh, craft a, a plan collectively? Um, I think the, the learnings for 360 Youth Services is um, really around the um, how it's brought the staff, our staff closer together. We've learned that we can pivot and adapt quickly. It, may not, it might not always be pretty, um, but that we can respond very quickly. And, and we've seen that not only with 360, but with all of the organizations in this community and how grateful um, we are to have partners, um, partners in Loaves and Fishes who've been able to transition with us and, and get a group delivery of food for our young people who are in transitional housing. So I think the some of the other lessons are it's really deepened relationships with other nonprofits um, that I think is just really important for the future for all of us and for this community. Um, so I think it's really, again, I think it goes back to this kind of what Carol said earlier about the we and then um, about relationships, relationships, relationships and, and how that's been missed individually um, because we've been in isolation, but it's also, I think, been missed and leveraged collectively. I think that's good. I love the, um, I'm a huge fan of the debrief. You know, I think so often we work ourselves so hard. We work a plan, whether that's an event or a program or whatever. And 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 then we just move on and, and we don't stop and take a pause and go, okay, let's assess what went well, what did not go so well, what can we carry forward, you know, so it really is less about the Band-Aid and more about the permanent mm -hmm. solution. So, um, Mike, talk a little bit, you know, a lesson learned, something that you, your staff, have feel that you will take forward with you. Right. I, I would say probably two things. First of all, we rolled out our new strategic plan last year, and, and two important parts of that strategic plan were uh, increasing a focus on our overall, uh, the overall health of our clients. And so when we think about overall health of our clients, when we think about all the issues that people have just broadly in the population as far as things like diabetes, heart issues, obesity, um, you know, this, uh, this chain of events has shown the value of being healthier, right? And so our focus on helping our clients being healthier, and that's largely in the form of providing uh, much healthier food for our clients, uh, again, we thought it was valuable. We set out our strategic plan, and now it has even a greater value uh, for clients to be healthier because they're you're more resistant to uh, to health issues that might come along. Uh, the other thing I would say is the use of technology. Again, a big part of our strategic plan. So I talked about our virtual food drive. Uh, one of the things that we're uh, going down the path on is online shopping, <clears throat> allowing that to, uh, up to be available for our clients. And again, if you think about this environment, if clients can shop online and choose the food they want, we fulfill the order and they come pick it up curbside. Uh, again, that model fits very well with what's going on now and, and might be uh, something that we all see more of just going forward, uh, given what we've all experienced here in, in, in March and April. So uh, again, focusing on client health, uh, Higher use of technology, I think, is um, are two things that are, are really um, have really rooted in pretty pretty strongly here. And kind of say, uh, Kim, you know, I know you mentioned right off the top that you were able very quickly after a lot of sleepless nights uh, to quickly take your model online. Um, so, mm -hmm. say, what have you learned in this process? 
So, you know, and I just have to give kudos to my team, right? So we are a small, small operation. There's five of us that work at the Career Networking Center. And there were lots of moving pieces and parts, you know, for those first three days to get everything off off and running. Um, for me, the, the kind of the silver lining the, 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 has been the glimpse into my team's um, personal lives um, with Zoom, right? We've been able to connect almost daily. Um, our, now it's twice, twice a week we're, we're connecting um, just to have our staff meetings. And watching them work from their living room, their basements, their kitchens with, you know, intrusions from kids and husbands and pets and, and all of that, um, I think has really been good for all of us to see. You know, we, we've all been able to, I mean, we, we, we were a great team before, we are even a better team today. And I think we're all better for that. Um, at the end of the day, we have this huge commitment to uh, what we do and uh, the clients that we serve. And so um, for me as, as, as a leader, um, it's been good for me to see that. And I just wanna echo again what Carol said about, um, and then Judy also um, spoke about, it's just, it's, it's the we, not me. Um, I think this is a new uh, a new normal for us as nonprofits, and um, I think we're all going to work. Um, not that we already we already didn't work well together, but we're we're going to come together and, and debrief and and talk about how we can continue to do great things in our community. So. I think that's true. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, in the sense that this virus has sort of, you know, scattered us into isolation, I, I absolutely echo what you say in terms of bringing us together. Um, mm -hmm. I, as we wrap up, I want to give each of you an opportunity. We're, we're, we've sort of done a little project with our board members. We're in the midst of doing this project with our staff. Uh, John Milton said way back in the 16th century, you know, the whole adage came of out of every cloud there is a silver lining. And so we have sort of started a little campaign about about that of trying to be reflective uh, and, and look for the positive because I think that's important for our mental health, right? Uh, for sure. So I, I'm just going to start with you, Scott, and I'm going to ask each of you, you know, uh, what has been your silver lining personally uh, as you've gone through this, this unprecedented six weeks? Well, one of the things I've thought a lot about <clears throat> is that prior to the uh, COVID-19 uh, there's a lot of research uh, that pointed to social fragmentation, the lack of personal connection as the major driver for the dramatic rise in suicide and rates of depression in this country. And I, I think, and I'm being really hopeful about this, that I think through this crisis, we're driven to be with each other in connection. You know, while we're distancing, we're also driven to be with one another in our families. And, and I think slow down in a way we wouldn't have. And I think out of that could come some really valuable insights that'll allow us to continue to see the value of connecting with the people in, in our lives. Yeah. Mike, yeah. silver lining for you. Yeah, I would say again to me, just, just seeing the power of the community come together uh, whether it's the nonprofits working with each other to, to, to find solutions to how to serve our clients to just other people uh, in the community. I can't tell you how many times I get phone calls from people and sometimes are people I talked to yesterday, sometimes maybe it was a year ago, and all they ask is, how can I help? What can I do to help? And to me, just to seeing that is absolutely uh, amazing. And the other thing I'll say is, uh, through crises like this, this is where leaders are made and leaders are born. And so um, I, I won't say anything about the age group of the people on this uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> you can see people in their 30s, let's say, uh, who are maybe just a tad younger than us, uh, stepping up and, 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 and taking charge. And they're being tested in this crisis. And um, you know they're, 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 they're proving their mettle. And it's great to see leaders being developed and being born and being tested. And I think, you know, as a community, um, we will benefit from that uh, significantly. Carol, what's your silver lining? Silver lining is hope is rising in this community. And I see it. I see it every day. I see the importance of a home. I see that people know 
that and that how important it is to have a home now in their lives. I see people who really care about the well-being of one another, and that is hope in itself. I see new partnerships being formed. But most of all, I stay with our tagline, when someone believes in you, everything can change. And that's <laughs> what we're seeing in this community. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Carol. Kim, silver lining for you. Silver lining, you know what? It's about um, watching how everyone is, I think to what Scott said, slowing down, taking everything all in, spending time with their families. I think we are realizing, you know, uh, I don't, I can't remember when this started, but how all these activities started coming in place on Sundays. Now people maybe will realize you don't have to play soccer on Sunday, right? I mean, you can have some really good family time. And just for me personally as well, um, I've been able, you know, my, my adult children are home. So for the first time since 2009, my kids are home for an extended period of time and I love it. So again, great family time. And I hope people really will take the time to embrace it. Judy. So this pandemic has certainly hit minority communities and low income communities disproportionately. And I think we've um, all kind of believed to some degree this adage of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And I think the silver lining in this pandemic is really being able to shine a light on the, that kind of adage as really a myth. And, and not a very helpful adage for any of us to live by. And that it's really about being able to even the playing field and being able to come together as a community and lift everyone up. Um, I think that's really, we've seen that play out day and, and day um, during this pandemic. And it's been really wonderful to see um, how um, important it's been to be able, be, being able to lift all communities up in this in this uh, crisis. Well said, well said. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you. I know uh, everybody is running very, very hard uh, with limited resources to be able to deliver on five incredible missions. Uh, I am delighted that you were able to take a few minutes and, and come spend some time with us and, and let the community know the good work that you're doing, where your needs still are, and what your hopes and dreams are as we go forward. So uh, thank you to Scott, to Mike, to Carol, to Kim, to Judy for being with us. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not thank our friends at Busey Bank. Uh, they have been a tireless supporter of us for many, many years, uh, done a lot to support the not-for-profit community right here in Naperville, so I thank them for their sponsorship of this show. Uh, and to all of you out there, uh, we're all experiencing this pandemic very differently. Um, nobody is experiencing it in the same way, uh, but we're all going through it together. Uh, we will all come out on the other side of it together, and if we uh, focus on that we, not me, that our, that everybody, that being aware of uh, all our different populations and, and how they're experiencing help and stress and strife, uh, we will be a better community together. So uh, please stay safe, stay separated for now, uh, together in thought and spirit and hope and dreams, and uh, be well, Naperville, be well. We look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. This special edition of Spotlight, the impact of COVID-19 on our nonprofit community, is brought to you in part by presenting sponsor, Busey Bank. Busey, your dreams, our promise.